Welcome. Welcome, members of Curtis Ford Christian Church, and welcome, guests. Please turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 17, as we look at Paul's sermon on Mars Hill. We see Paul here in the city of Athens, and he's, he's been to Thessalonica, he's been to Berea, and now his friends have conducted him to the city of Athens in verse 15. Receiving your command for Silas and Timothy to come to him with all speed, they departed. Then in verse 16, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Paul's spirit was provoked because he had seen that this great city of Athens was handed over to idols. It was in their grip. Paul was provoked. It's not that the Athenians had made some kind of a, a daring challenge to Paul, but simply by being given over to idols, Paul was provoked. And that should be our attitude as well when we see a world that is in the grip of Satan. We should say, we are provoked. When we hear Goliath shout and blaspheme God, we should be provoked. When we see the world lost, we should be provoked. We can't be silent when we see that the world is in the grip of darkness. Therefore, in verse 17, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshippers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. Here we see the Apostle Paul in the marketplace of ideas where the gospel should be preached. And then certain Epicureans and Stoic philosophers encountered him. Now the Epicureans, those were the philosophers who thought that the greatest pleasure is the greatest good. And it's not that they went after simple, shallow hedonism. But they thought that if a person is sophisticated enough, he will actually get pleasure out of doing good. There were also the Stoic philosophers who thought that the way to avoid pain in this world was simply to be detached from everything. Well, these came and they asked, what does this Babylon want to say? And others say he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them. He preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. They thought of resurrection itself as a, a supernatural entity. They took him and they brought him to the Areopagus. This was their, their forum there on Mars Hill, Areopagus. And Mars Hill is, means the exact same thing. And they said, when we, when, maybe when we know, may we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak? For you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. They had heard Paul, but they hadn't got a complete idea of what Paul was teaching. And so now they want, they want to bring him to the forum where everybody gathered there can, can hear what he has to say. All the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. And so then Paul stood up in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. Now this was a, a polite way of saying, I see that if, if, they had baseball, if they had baseball back then, Paul would have said, I see that in every, every chance you get, you make sure you cover all the bases. You don't leave anything to chance. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even, I even found an altar with this inscription, To the Unknown God. Now there on Mars Hill, there were all kinds of, of statues. Statue to Zeus, statue to Apollo, statue to Poseidon, statue to Aphrodite, statue to the god of the flies. They had it all covered. When everybody had a, a need, they would find out which which god, which god in the, in the pantheon is the special, specializes in that need, and that's who they would pray to. Well, every now and then there would be a plague. And to make sure they had all their bases covered, so to speak, they would even put out altars like this. To the unknown God. I don't know who we've offended, but we 
want to erect the statue to, to you, unknown God, please take away the plague. And Paul has seen just such an altar, with no statue on it, no image. And so Paul said, that's the God I declare to you. You have this statue, this, this altar without a statue that says, to the unknown God, well, therefore the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. The God that you know you ought to worship, but you don't know about him, let me tell you about him. God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. Now, temples made with hands, that was the, that was the Greek specialty. We know of the, 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 the Parthenon. We know of many great temples. In Ephesus, the, the Temple of Diana was one of the wonders of the ancient world. The Greeks applied their craftsmanship, their, their skill to worship the gods. But they would present their worship picturing the gods and the image of men. They would picture the gods as, well, they're, they're like supermen. Zeus, Apollos, uh, Apollo, Zeus, Apollo, Poseidon, they're just like supermen. But they also have the frailties of men. In their myths, they would picture them as very human, very flawed beings. And here Paul says, God is not like that. He doesn't dwell in temples made with human hands. He's not limited to that. He's made, he's, he, he's not worshipped with man's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. Now even today in some movies, the, the gods are a picture, you know, the, old, the uh, Percy Jackson uh, series of recent movies. Or perhaps you may recall uh, the Clash of the Titans, in which the gods say to each other, we, we need the humans. We feed off of their prayers. Paul says, God is beyond us. God is transcendent. God gives to us. He doesn't need anything from us. He has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth. All human beings are from God. All human beings, every nation, every ethnic group, comes from God. He's made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth. God has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. You Greeks may think you're special. You're, you're not Scythians, you're not barbarians, you're Greeks. But God also made the Scythians. God made every nation. So that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him. Though he is not far from each one of us. God is our creator. He hasn't created one person any more than any other person. He's created us equal. And he's not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move, and have our being. As also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold, or silver, or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. God's image is not captured by a statue. God's image is not captured by, by human skill and artwork. God is more than that. If you want to see where the temple is that God dwells in, look to the born-again heart of the believer. Now these times of ignorance, when people worship God by, by thinking God needs us, by thinking God could be bribed, these times of ignorance, God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Good news, God is close to you. 
for the news is also, you're not on his side. You who've been seeking God, you, you've been groping, you've been stretching out into the, into the darkness thinking, is, is that him? God says, he calls everyone to repent. It's good news that God is near, but also it's a challenge. God calls us to repent. And it's not that he's picking that one to repent. He's not picking that one to repent, but God is calling all men to repent. Because God has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. And he has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Now at that point, when some of the Athenians heard about the resurrection from the dead, some of them mocked. And there are some today who, when they hear about the resurrection of the dead, will mock. Some will mock and say, oh, come on, we, we, we all know when you're dead, you're dead. And some will say, yeah, we'll, we'll get back to you on this. Some said, like we see a character later in the book of Acts say, a more convenient day, Paul, and I'll call upon you. But God is calling upon everyone, everywhere, now, to repent because the day of judgment is coming while we have the opportunity let us repent God has provided a king for us God has provided a way for us God has provided a purpose God has provided a purpose for us to be reconciled to him and he calls us to repent and follow that way in response there were some who mocked there were some who procrastinated and put it off but there were some who joined him and believed among them Dionysius the Areopagite and a woman named Damaris and others with them what shall we do with this invitation when we hear the good news that God is calling us to repent may we take that invitation may we surrender to God and live our lives finding the greatest good the glory of God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, what a blessing it is to hear those words. You now command everyone, everywhere, to repent. Because you have given us the true King, Jesus. That through him, we can seek and find the greatest good. Your glory, expressed in our lives, made new as your children, endowed with your spirit, whose temple you have created us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. We come now to the Lord's table. The Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. same manner also he took the cup after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood this do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me The service is now concluded. Go in peace.